fast an interesting one to look at because it's quite a clever design when it was produced is the Apple II. So we have a corrupted Apple II, so let me just uh, turn it off and on again. The technology changes but the methods stay the yeah. same. So the Apple II, we've got a Apple boot floppy here, five and a quarter inch. This uh, machine actually came from the Cambridge Centre for Computing History, so uh, but, um, notice the noise it made when I switched it on. That was the heads on the drive being sent straight back to the first track on the disc so it could start loading in the operating system. So the Apple II had an interesting arrangement for storing the data because Steve Wozniak, when he created it, managed to completely reduce the amount of electronics needed to drive the floppy drive compared to all the other machines at the time. The way that a floppy disk and certain tape formats will store the data is that they will encode the binary data, so the zero and the one that the computer needs to store. So it encodes a one by changing the flux parity. So if it's one way, it'll change it to the other. And if it's that way, it'll change it back if only wants to store a one. It encodes a zero by saying that I'm going to leave the magnetic flux polarities recording the same thing as what the previous bit of information was. So that's how it encodes the information. The problem with that is you can't just write the ones and zeros of the byte that you want to record to the disk because if you have a large string of zeros, because the timings aren't accurate and vary between two different floppy drives, you wouldn't be able to sync the computer to the actual data coming off the disk and know whether there was two zero bits here or was it three zero bits that was on a machine that was writing too fast or am I reading three zero bits on a machine that's reading too slowly, etc. So you have to set down certain rules for how the information is stored. So what Steve Wozniak decided to do is use a thing called group code recording to encode the data. So rather than storing the eight bits of data that he wanted to store directly onto the disk, he, because of these things you couldn't do that, what he actually did was to say, I'm going to encode this data in a specific way. So he, what he did is he took five bits of the data he wanted to write and he had two rules that he used to store the information on the disk. Firstly, he said, I'm going to write into eight bits at a time. And each of those eight bits is going to start with a one. So the most significant bit of the byte that he's going to write will start with a one. So that was his first rule, that all the bytes would start with a specific one. The second rule, he said, was there could only be a maximum of one zero bits between any two one bits that were written out. This meant that the electronic could easily keep in sync with the data as it came off the disk and work out what bits were being recorded. What this means is, is that a code like 10111011 is absolutely fine to use because it meets both rules. We've got a one as the most significant bit, and we have no more than at least one zero bit between any two ones. On the other hand, to code like 01111111, that wouldn't be allowed. That one is allowed because we're starting with a zero. And because we know that all the bytes start with a 1, we can easily lock on to the first most significant bit of the byte because we know it must be a 1. Also, a code like this wouldn't be allowed because we've got two 0 bits in succession. There are only 34 different 8-bit values that meet both of these two rules, i.e. they start with a 1 and they have no more than one zero between any two 1 bits. 34 different possible values gives us enough information to encode five binary bits of data. So five bits of data, which is 2 to the power of 5 is 32, which is less than the 34 different values. So what Steve Wozniak did in software rather than in hardware like everyone else was doing at the time was to take five bits of data from the, that he wanted to store and using a lookup table in memory, convert it into whichever of the codes was used to store that data. If we look at the floppy drive we have here... Was it cheaper? Was that cheaper to make? Or something? It was cheaper to make because... A lot of the controls are here are to do things like um, control the stepper motor that drive the head backwards and forwards and spin the disc. He was able to replace that with software controlled things on the I.O. card for the Apple II. He had to be very clever and build a very specialised processor based around a ROM chip to actually read the data back in, but to write the data he could do it all through software. A very clever design which people respected. Does the floppy have some kind of table of contents? How does it know where to start with anything? Well, this is a very good question. There's actually two things you need to be aware of. First of all, you need to know 
where the file actually is that you want to access on the disk, which sector it is and on which track. So if we want to access the file, let's call it CP, we need to know that it's stored at track 2, sector 2 and so on. And so we'd have a catalogue on the disk that would say that CP begins at track 2, sector 2. And so all the disk file formats you've got basically are ways of mapping from file names to different tracks and sectors on the disk. How do you know where sector 1 starts on the disk and that you're not reading sector 2? Or how sector 3 starts on the disk? Five and a quarter inch disks, I don't know, if I move the light here. So as I spin it, you'll see there's a little hole and there's a sensor inside the drive which will actually look for that hole. It's just a light shining through it to a cell on the other. And that will tell it where it becomes to the beginning of the track. So that, that allowed it to orient itself basically. Exactly, so it was a way of finding out where it was. Some of the first floppy disks actually had another uh, index hole and so each of the sectors were hard marked on the disk with holes so that you could actually detect where you were. So one of the other things that Steve Wozniak decided to do was to use some of the unused codes that he had. He had 34 codes but only 32 of them to represent the data he was storing to mean the beginning of a sector. So we use D5 and AA in hex as values to represent the, be the beginning of a sector. So that whenever you saw the sequence D5 AA96, you knew you'd become to the start of a sector because that sequence was guaranteed to never appear in the actual data because neither D5 or AA were used to represent data. So you could mark the beginning of the sector. And actually you could do that with clever things so you didn't actually necessarily need to use the index hole at all. This is called a soft sector disk and all hard disks and modern floppies use that. Do you want a true bit of trivia on those? In South Africa they're nicknamed stiffies. <laughs> that may not make the final cut. <laughs> I'm blushing. <laughs>